and can I have some scrap here? Hi, Susie, can you hear me? Yeah, you can. Yep. All right. So Susie, you have your, um, I have to open up another something to get that. I have do you want to just take the screen and share it or do your business? I can do that. I can, I have it I on Google slides and I'll just make it, too. you know, I'll take, I'll share and I'll just I make my something. screen the whole thing kind of thing. There we go. Okay. We can practice. Mm. I need I, you need to make sure we're all co-hosts then. Yep. Okay. But that's something I should have done a while ago. Let's see I if we can make this bigger. I moved my computer. Um, I'm going to be saying this a lot tonight. I wanted to be near the window and the sun because I didn't want to be in the dark. So I said, I can't, I can't get on the dark right now. So where are we making you co-host? Um, I just opened it live, live. Nope. Share screen. This is where I'm gonna have to call my daughter. I know I have I think this. it's the three dots on the right, but it's like I can't see it now because I'm not host. So right. I know I did it. It's all live. Hello. Hi, all. Hi. Good evening. Thanks for being patient with us. We're trying to give times a little, give people a little extra time um, because of the crazy hour of the day. Um, <laughs> but we thank you for letting us come into your home tonight. I'm Kate Schmidt, and I'm the sustainability coordinator for Orange County, as well as a land use planner in the Department of Planning. And um, I'm going to ask everyone to please mute yourself right now. Put all your devices on mute for the sake of everyone tonight. We know some people are going to be washing dishes, cooking, cutting. So please, please, please mute yourself now. Um, and again, you can come off mute and talk and ask your questions and have conversation. But we just want to be mindful and respectful of everyone. Uh, we're going to take comments and questions at the end of each topic, but just a few to keep on time. And we'll do more at the end. Um, and we're asking any CAC or CSC folks to stay on and uh, give a little update of what you're doing. And uh, maybe we could help each other uh, advance all of our efforts. So I'm also asking that you use the chat box tonight to identify yourself. Please put your name, where you live, what group you're in, whatever you want to write, uh, your favorite joke, if you volunteer, what your pet peeve is, what your issue is, whatever um you would like help with okay use that chat box it's a great opportunity um to exchange ideas and get to know more and um, also remember that this session is being recorded and it will be available on the orange county website specifically on the sustainability page in about a week or so and that's www.orangecountygov.com backslash sustainability and i will put that in the chat Lastly, credits can be granted for your attendance in this class, but it's up to your <laughs> municipality to decide if they honor the credits as part of the New York State Mandatory Planning and Zoning Board official training. So, um, you know, we could tell you they were there, but your town should already approve it ahead of time. With that out of the way, let's get to our great line of talented speakers that are doing wonderful work. And many times such great work only gets initiated and executed due to the advocacy of tireless volunteers. 
And if there's any volunteer wannabes on the call tonight wondering how to get involved, please let me know via the chat box. Uh, one of my roles at the planning department is to help start and support conservation advisory commissions, as well as CACs. Um, you call that environmental review boards, environmental advisory groups, um, also climate smart communities. That's a newer name for it. The acronym is CSC. And um, if you want to get involved with any sustainability minded groups, people, I'm here to help you and assist you toward that goal. If your municipality does not have a conservation group and you think it should, well, I'm here to help you guide you through that process to get that. Just reach out to me if you have any questions or comments or ideas, and I'll put my contact information in the chat. Like I said, I welcome exploring all options and all ideas. And one amazing volunteer that had the nerve to celebrate her birthday and um, with her young children and her aging parents in the state of Florida could not be here tonight. Her name is Peyton Swenson, and she took over the reins from the great Elizabeth McKnight, who started the county's first repair cafe and co-authored a book about the repair cafe and also founded Orange County's only Too Good to Toss event in Warwick. And while Peyton could not join us tonight, she wanted me to convey that she is working on an in-depth guide of how to start a Too Good to Toss event and is willing to present that at a later date if folks are interested. Alternatively, I encourage you all to check it out for yourself on June 1st and June 2nd at Stanley Deming Park in Warwick. If you cannot wait that long, you could also just go to the website wickhamworks.org, Too Good to Toss, and I'll, of course, put that in the chat box as well as her contact information. But basically what happens at a too good to toss event is what it sounds like. Warwick residents only bring their donations on Saturday, June 1st to Stanley Deming Park. The volunteers set it all up, organize it. They have big tents in case of rain and all folks from any municipality is welcome to bring containers, boxes, bags, bins on Sunday and fill them up with all these free goodies. The intent is to take as much as you need. Maybe not to sell, but definitely no hoarding, no piling, no standing vehicles. So again, if you have burning questions, you could put them in the chat and maybe someone on this call can help answer them um, and get you an answer tonight. So having said that, let's get started. We're kicking off with Susie Fromer, the coordinator for the Repair Cafe Hudson Valley. Um, which is a consortium of over 60 repair cafes in New York that was founded by John Wackman in 2013. John also co-authored the book um, for the Repair Cafe with Elizabeth McKnight, and unfortunately we lost him a few years ago way too early. Um, the daughter of antique dealers, Susie, who specialized in the restoration of vintage furniture and woodworking tools, Susie grew up shopping at flea markets and antique shows for vintage jewelry, as well as assisting in her father's workshop. A lifelong gem and mineral collector, she learned metal smithing and jewelry making first as a camper at Buck Rock's Creative Work Camp, and later as a teaching assistant at Dartmouth's College Claffin Jewelry Studio. She has spent the last 18 years in Westchester, where she has run a food allergy support group. And she has chaired the board of her local farmer's market and run a jewelry making and repair business. She started volunteering as a jewelry repair coach at the Hastings Repair Cafe in 2019 and fell in love with the repair cafe concept. She lives in Irvington and can be found fixing jewelry at a repair cafe throughout the Hudson Valley almost every weekend. So please take it away, Susie. Hello, it's nice to see everyone. I, um, yeah, I live in Westchester, but we do have repair cafes throughout Orange County, as well as many other counties in Hudson Valley, and I am there often. Um, and I just, I'm doing a presentation on Repair Cafe Hudson Valley, which is a group that is a consortium of these repair cafes. So what is a repair cafe? It is a local pop-up event where community members get their beloved but broken items fixed by volunteer fixers who are also their neighbors. They're these very grassroots local community events. Each one is locally run by volunteers, but I, as the coordinator for Repair Cafe Hudson Valley, give a lot of assistance 
And in addition, we have all the organizers of our 60 cafes networked behind the scenes, and we all support each other. Repair cafes build community and serve as a town square for our neighbors to come together. What else repair cafes do? They reduce waste, save things from the landfill. They save people money. They preserve and pass down repair skills. They show people who have these skills that they're valued. They feed our curiosity. We're definitely there to teach other people how to repair things. It's not a drop-off service. We also empower people by showing them how to repair their own items. They foster community. They bring us joy. And they help us change our relationship with our things that we can fix our own items. We don't have to be at the mercy of something that breaks and buy a new one. We can go somewhere and also learn to fix our own things. Uh, where does the cafe concept come from? It started in Amsterdam in 2009. This is actually the 15th year where so they're celebrating, the International Foundation is celebrating 15 years. And it was brought to New Paltz in 2013 by Jan Wackman, who was a board member of Sustainable Hudson Valley. And Repair Cafe is a program of Sustainable Hudson Valley. He also co-authored with Elizabeth Knight, who was the founder of the Warwick Cafe, Repair Revolution, which is a book about repair cafes. Uh, so, yeah, and he unfortunately passed away suddenly in 2021, and it was really devastating to the community. He had really been the impetus for a lot of people starting cafes, but everyone in his memory has continued, and the movement has just really recovered from COVID and, and really grown. So in, in 2022, we held 69 cafes, but last year in 2023, we held 130 cafes. Uh, it averages about 40 guests with one to two items per cafe, but it varies widely between a very small rural cafe and one that's more in a city. About 75% of items are fixed. So that was 3,000 items roughly kept out of the landfill in 2022 and 6,000 kept out of the landfill in 2023. Often more items are fixed after a cafe with parts or advice given. And sometimes things are repaired at home the next time. 3,000 repair cafes worldwide is the number, and it is also always growing. This is a list of uh, our areas and how many we have per uh, each area. And you can just see we're trying to keep it to the Hudson Valley, but we're also in the Catskills. We're also in the... Um, in the capital region and we just started a new area we call the north country because we just everyone has been wanting to do these Oops. so here's another just a breakdown of where the cafes are so you can see the orange county cafes and we've had a lot of growth there which has been very exciting and we have four in sullivan county as well uh where are cafes held we get a lot of free spaces. It has to be a free space because the whole cafe, there is not funding for it. It has to come from grassroots and getting grassroots support. So free cafes, free spaces, and they come in all sorts of, of different venues. Maker spaces are fabulous. We have a lot of support from churches and, and other organizations religiously, community centers. We've had some at firehouses and a lot of our libraries. Uh, what volunteer roles are there at a cafe? There's the organizers, hopefully a t small team of people who are the ones behind the scene and be before the event, making the event happen. But then there's also physical setup and breakdown at the event. Check-in volunteers are very important. They help us make sure all the paperwork is signed, and they also help triage what station people need to go to. Runners or ushers is some another category of people who help get you where you need to be to get things fixed and makes thing, things run smoothly. Translators if needed. Um, bakers and home cooks also help play, play a role because again, everything is donated. And so if we don't have to pay for food because people made it, that's helpful. And then of course the repair coaches, but you don't have to be handy to play a very valuable role at a cafe. Uh, what stations are at repair cafes? The most typical one, the one that is the most important is electrical. Um, it is lamps are the most requested fix and then vacuums happen a lot. Mechanical, sometimes there's a lot of overlap, but we this is just to see what the difference is. It doesn't plug in. Textiles and sewing is very common and very, very well utilized at the cafes. Jewelry, there I am, I do jewelry. And we also, we're all expanding into watches because everyone's always bringing their watch to open it and give it a battery. Uh, woodworking, computers, bike repair, knife and blade sharpening can often, often be something. It just depends on who the volunteers are that are available. So gluing stations is something we've seen people set up. Uh, and then other things that are at a cafe, coffee snacks for the guests, it's a cafe. 
If you want an information table, you could have composting recycling information. Often master gardeners will do a presentation. We'll try to have a kids take it apart table to engage kids in repair and also just to keep them out of your hair. And uh, specialty fixers, if they're available. We have a welder who comes to some. We have photo restoration. We have someone who does zipper repair, screen fixing for, you know, doors and windows. Whatever people can do, it's available. We have them come. It's really fabulous. And each cafe is very, very different from the last. Uh, and just to hear some of our fixes, this is a pearl restring I did. It's not knotted. It was just a simple restring. This is a table leg that was literally repaired. That third lighter one was made at the makerspace. It was just an unbelievable repair. This is Dan, <laughs> accomplished fixers, um, fixing a uh, very fancy cuckoo clock. Um, jewelry clocks. We have several clock fixers. This was some eel fork, some vintage eel fork that the welder welded. It was an old phone. Music repair, <laughs> old Santa wasn't working too well. Uh, all kinds of stuff, just so much stuff. Not all of it, it can be fixed, but again, 75% of it is fixed and kept out of the landfill. And in New York State, repair cafes earn four climate smart community points if you hold two cafes in five years. So that is one of the reasons there's so much support in New York for this program. And this is me. I, what I do, I do a lot of things, but one of the things that I do is help people start these cafes. Again, it has to be a team or a local person from the town. We do not have a cafe. I am the only employee of Repair Cafe Hudson Valley. Everyone else is a volunteer. And so if, but if you want to start one, give me a call, send me an email. And I am always connecting people from the town. I keep things, I keep things, I keep things. And finally you get a, a enough people, all of a sudden you have a team, you know? So as the central clearing Point for all contact. It really helps to get everyone. And then I also send fixers and all that stuff. But um, so that's what I do. And I'm going to stop my share because that's my whole presentation. So uh, yeah, thank you. Fantastic, Susie. Thank you. And um, while Nicole is booting up her presentation, I will start with only two cafes in five years for four points. Yes. Yes. I think after that, you have to continue to, up, you know, renew and show that you've had another cafe, but it isn't a lot. And so we do have a lot of cafes that um, will work together. They will like two towns will work together because if they each have one cafe in a year, you know, it's, it's not it's not a huge ask. So what I would as someone who has been trying to get a cafe for a long time um, in Goshen, I've studied this, the ins and outs, what would work. Um, and the reason why I can't is uh, fixers for the most part and then um, location. But I guess um, if you only have one a year, so the reason why Warwick's is so successful to everyone on the call is they are religious about it. They've been doing it forever. Yes, you could talk about they have an affluent, educated community, second homers, you know, that want to do this. It's very social, as Susie said, this is what it's meant to be. Um, so folks love to do it. But how do you do it one time a year? I know it's going to be that third Saturday of every other month. I know that bring the clock, bring the hairdryer, bring the smoke machine. If you only do it once a year, is it the Friday before Thanksgiving very busy? Um, is it, you know, like, how do you tell, how does your community know? Maybe it's during Earth Day. Uh, the town of War Woodbury is doing that now. Highland Falls, Olga's on, is doing something like in conjunction with Earth Day. Or do you do it in the winter when no one's around in January? How do you just do it once a year and expect people to come out? Why are they going to hold on to that broken lamp that long? You know, we have a Mamaronek Cafe does one once a year. And people, the feedback is they would love it to be more often. But it is a lot of work. And of work. So that's how they do it. What is what is working is that there is such a network in almost every county that you can go to another cafe yeah. another weekend or another month. Right. right. And Susie, being the only paid employee, is very valuable because that is what she does, is she gets us all of the regional um, cafes. So therefore, maybe I make it if that if I'm tired of looking at that broken lamp, maybe I'm going to go up to New Paul's. Maybe I'm going to go to Kingston. Maybe Everyone's I'm going to make a day welcome. of it and go all you know, them, have yes. fun with it. Mm -hmm. Again, these are social events, and so it's enjoyable going. And also we have at least one person on the call, Woodbury and Highland. I think we talked about it. I'm not sure if we did it, but merging it, moving forward. They're kicking off their initial events, but really 
going forward, maybe you do merge it if you're adjacent communities, and then therefore one does it in the winter, one does it in the summer, and maybe you're getting credit if you're doing it both places twice. Um, five years is just a lot to have only two cafes to get four points. So if anyone's done those points, you can understand why I'm a little shocked about this. All right, does anyone else have any questions? For Susie, you can put them in the chat if you think about them, or if you have it now, you can come off. But Nicole, you were just on, right? I was get... on, but then my, my kid came in the room, so I had to close it to mute, so sorry. Those damn kids, I know, <laughs> as mine comes in right now, and I'm going to do the finger. I always do the quiet yeah. um, face. So um, can you see it again? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Right. And I'm going to mute so that the dog doesn't bark. Okay. So, hi, I'm Nicole from Helpsy. Um, Helpsy is a clothing textile <laughs> collection company. Our mission is to keep clothes out of the trash, well, pretty much out of the waste stream. Um, we provide honorable honorable work and we earn um, and to earn a growing profit. We're a certified B Corp and a public benefits corp. Um, we're proud to meet the high standards of verified and social performance. So we operate three lines of business. The one I'm going to talk to you about is the collect business. Um, but we also have a source business and the trading business. So Helpsy collects from over 1,200 locations in 10 states. So that's from New Hampshire down to South Carolina. So why do we do what we do? We have uh, the environmental reasons, the social reasoning, and the economic reasoning. This, the environmental reasoning is um, we've been able to collect over 31 million pounds of clothing. We've um, saved 31 billion gallons of water. We've avoided uh, CO2, 236,000 tons of CO2. Um, our social impact is for our employee, our, as an employer and a community. So we offer full-time jobs to all of our employees. They are paid living wages. They're paid commissions. We're all shareholders. Um, and then helps you as an intentional second chance employer. Um, community wise, we have given just in last year, $500,000 to our nonprofit partners. We donated over 30,000 coats. And then of course we're a B Corp and a public benefits corp. The economic part of it is we've helped, um, municipalities avoid $1.5 million in disposal fees. Um, we've enabled more than 10,000 reuse economy jobs, and we support over 800 United States thrift stores. <clears throat> so the textile waste problem, there is a problem. It's the fast gr fastest growing waste stream. 85% of textiles end up in the landfill. As you can see on this chart, textiles is only going to continue to grow. So what we want to do is make it as easy as recycling, you know, your plastics, you know, make sure you put your garbage out, make sure you put your textiles out for a home pickup, put them in a bin, donate them to the thrift store. Um, we have, we have these options for municipalities, but we also do clothing drives for any organization, any nonprofit, anybody just looking to raise money for their school, for a thrift store. So we have the traditional bins that can be placed on any property, you know, as long as you're the owner of the property. Uh, we do the clothing drive events. Those can be at any kind of um, any kind of event. They can be at like if a municipality does it, they have hazardous waste days, paper shredding, and it's just one big event. You can add textiles to that. If you just wanted it to happen at your school, the school can host an event one day, a whole week, a whole month, and then we pick up all the materials. And then um, we do provide home pickups, but that has to be through the municipality. So we have to be partnered with the municipality in order to provide the home pickups. Um, I'm going to skip this one because it's not only, it's not a lot of just municipal people. It's, you know, the call has everybody on there, but it's just really easy to sign up with us. And we provide digital marketing for anybody, for any any uh, collection mode that we do, whether you place bins, we can provide some kind of marketing. If you do a clothing drive, we, pres we present um, social media posts, flyers, we do press releases. Um, these are the <laughs> items that we accept. So we take textiles in any condition that's from the worst quality to the best quality, as long as they're dry. Um, and then what happens to the clothing? <clears throat> so 
what we do at Helpsy is we focus on the best next use for the clothing. The best option for clothing is to reuse it as is. 95% of what we collect is sold for reuse or recycling. Unfortunately, 5% of that is unusable, contaminated, usually, you know, with like oils, blood, you know, wet, things like that. A growing percent of what we collect is being sorted right in our warehouse ourselves in um, our New Jersey warehouse. And then a lot of the stuff that we have is sold domestically within the United States to thrift stores and resellers. The majority um, of what we collect is sold to bulk customers and graders. That's a global mar market, but we have most of our partners are domestic partners. Um, we even have such good relationships with all of our um, partners that what we do is we'll buy back items that they can't use. <clears throat> so that includes plus sizes, coats, uh, different items. And that's it. Simple presentation. Thank you. Simple is always good. Um, does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. Um Helpsy is something that then our next speaker, Ermin, you can take control and put up your presentation if you would. And I apologize, I don't think I read your bio. Um, normally I do it in the beginning. So, um, but Ermin is someone who we're thinking about trying to get this in the county. So if anyone um, can digest what Nicole just said and um, stay with us at the end and see if we can do something together. But um, I appreciate that, Nicole. Thank you very much. And um, lastly, we have Orange County's Recycling Coordinator who's been with us for 19 years in sustainability and 16 <laughs> years in materials management. If everyone can please mute their phones, that would be, or their computers, that would be great. Um, Ermin, I think you're gonna kick off with, uh, or at some point you're going to fill in for the recycle coach and tell us about composting food scraps. Please take it away. Ermin, you are muted. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, before I begin, um, I saw that there was a question from Joanna Goldfarb in the uh, chat. I don't oh, know great. if Cole wanted you. to pick that up before I begin? Yeah, no, that'd be great. Um, so Joanna from the Catskill mm -hmm. Ramapo Library System, their sustainability coordinator, asked to hold a clothing drive with Helpsy. Does it have to be a public event, I'm assuming, or can it just be a drop off? And I know that answer. So go, Nicole. It, it doesn't have to be public. We do it with schools that are only for in the school. We do it with corporations that are just in their office. It doesn't have to be, you know, for the public. So, but it also, okay. Do you want to give a few different iterations of with the school? So, yeah, so, with so, the college campus? Yep, so if you do it at a school, um, usually what the school does, they do it. If they want it open to the public, they'll host it on a weekend that everybody can just drive up to school, drop things off. If not, they host it within the school. They make it like a fun event for the kids. They collect it for the whole week. We pick it up. Um, or they can even do it to where they collect for the whole month. And that's just all the kids that come to the school to drop off the items. We work with um, colleges to do their campus cleanouts. Um, they host lots of clothing bins, lots of collections. So um, it does not have to be open to the public. We even have our bins that aren't open to the public. They're just for, you know, thrift store use. They're locked locker bins. So it just depends on what you're looking for. We're happy to work any way we can to keep the textiles out of the landfill, so. Great, thank you. Ermin, you ready? Yep. All right, well, uh, thank you, Kate, and thank you everyone for joining on, uh, I'm sure, what is likely a busy evening for everybody, um, but taking your time out to learn about sustainability and solid waste and different action items we can all take to kind of <laughs> really begin to move the needle. My goal here tonight is to take a step back and look at it from a bird's eye view, look at our waste generation and bird, from a bird's eye view, and then uh, talk a little bit about, you know, the county and what our facilities currently handling, and then focus in on some key points that we can really together uh, begin to address together locally 
uh, in hopes of moving the needle, as I just mentioned. But uh, yep. So we are uh, the Division of Environmental Facilities and Services. We're out of the Department of Public Works in Orange County. We have three transfer stations in Orange County, uh, one in New Hampton, Newburgh, and Port Jervis, and also a sewer district down in Heron. Uh, and also, uh, a lot of these overview slides, I may kind of just skim over and skim through. I'm not going to go into the gory details of many. A lot of it is just to provide context to uh, the action items that I'll be presenting later. Um, these are the hours uh, and locations of each transfer station. Please note that in Newburgh, uh, we closed our bulk solid waste uh, receiving area uh, indefinitely. Uh, it's currently only open in New Hampton, but there are uh, citizens drop-off areas at each one of the three transfer stations. So as a snapshot, uh, we take in about 76,000 tons of MSW every year, uh, in addition to another 10,500 tons of pre-sorted recyclables. Our MSW, or trash, goes to Keystone Landfill in Pennsylvania, and our single-stream recyclables go to a material recovery facility uh, in Airmont, down in Rockland County. Uh, after a little sorting and an extra and, and some additional um, transloading, the materials go to Jersey City or the Bronx uh, to uh, facilities owned by IWS or Action Carding. And as I mentioned, there are res residential drop-off areas at each one, each three of the transfer stations where residents can bring their own waste and recycling to dispose or recycle uh, alongside whatever curbside uh, program that they currently have. Uh, so what does our waste look like? So this is kind of a pie chart created by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency uh, from a waste characterization study done in 2018. We generated a total of 292.4 uh, million tons of solid waste. Uh, and just by looking at the pie chart, we can see a big chunk of it is paper and paperboard. And <coughs> on the bottom left, um, You'll have food, which is about 22%, and yard trimming is about 12 So uh, that is what's termed as the organics waste stream. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Other key uh, parts of this pie chart are plastics, which are about 12%, and a growing textiles uh, piece of the pie there uh, at about 6%. So why are we talking about this? Why is it important to talk about recycling our textiles or repair? Basically, we're running out of a way, right? We always say, oh, just the, the common mantra, just throw it away, right? When you want to deal with something. Uh, we're, we're running out of that kind of uh, cushion, right? Uh, based on data collected by Waste Business Journal, over the next five years, total landfill capacity in the U.S. is forecast to decrease by more than 15%, which that means that by 2021, only 15 years of landfills capacity will remain. And in some reason, regions, it could be half that. So it's a pretty dire uh, forecast there. Um, there is, you know, some power though that we have in kind of really working towards addressing this dilemma. Uh, and we're going to hopefully talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we're, we've already showed you some solutions. And we're going to talk about a few more as well tonight. Um, so how to handle this? Uh, the US, US EPA recommends that we work through the materials management hierarchy which focuses on source reduction and reuse as the first goal, uh, recycling composting as the second goal, energy recovery as the third goal, and then of course, treatment and disposal is the least preferred last goal. We're gonna talk about the top two here at this presentation. So what's waste prevention? Uh, waste prevention, we make over four, four and a half pounds of waste per person per day. Uh, waste prevention, also known as source reduction, means using less material to get a job done, uh, waste prevention methods help create less waste in the first place before recycling. So what are some ways we can reduce waste? We can refuse it by ditching single-use waste items. Um, we can reuse more, right? And we can repair. Uh, here are some resources. I'm not going to go really in-depth on this. Um, Kate mentioned that the presentation will be up on the county uh, planning website and also a PDF could be available to anyone who wants to access these, but uh, you can see, uh, you know, a number of issues in regards to the BYO bag initiative uh, with the waste that was sparked by the uh, Plastic Bag Waste Reduction Act. 
in 2020. Uh, you can bring your plastic bags, try to refuse plastic bags, but of the plastic bags that you generate, you can bring them back to most chain box stores for recycling. Uh, and if you find that that box store is not recycling plastic bags, there is a way uh, through the Department of Conservation to actually report that box store and make sure that they get uh, plastic bag recycling. So that's just one op option. There's also the Reclothe NY initiative, which shows you where you can drop off your textiles. So, of course, Healthy is a major player in that. So there are many others that are, you know, around the region that are accepting textiles waste. Uh, for recycling. There's a Save the Food uh, initiative, which is a, a resource uh, put together by the U.S. Ad Council uh, to really promote the fact that uh, a lot of our food is being, uh, a lot of our food is being wasted uh, and promote the fact that there are many ways that we can address this dilemma and savethefood.com has some great tips on how to, how to reduce your food waste by, you know, meal planning and other food conservation and preservation techniques. And of course, here are some upcoming repair cafes. Um, do jot them down. They're coming up this weekend. So I hope to see you guys there. Uh, and also the county is working on a cool initiative called OC Green Grub, uh, which uh, aims to provide single-use waste reduction resources to businesses. Um, so this could include techniques such as, you know, refilling stations, uh, reusing or being able to bring in uh, your own cutlery and other techniques and, and other strategies that uh, businesses uh, can apply uh, that would of course be Department of Health approved um, to you know, ensure that we have options to reduce the amount of single use trash is being generated at businesses. So we're working on that guide and hopefully we'll be revealing uh, that in the coming year. Um, talk a little bit about reuse. There are plenty of reuse options throughout the county. Um, Habitat for Humanity Restore in Newburgh is a, is a great one. Um, each one of these reuse stores or, or um, thrift stores, they have specific items uh, that they accept. So definitely call ahead. Um, Dirt Magazine's Recyclopedia is a great resource as well, um, where you can find many more sites where you can bring odds and ends, you know, whether it be housewares, appliances, um, art supplies, you name it. Um, to locations such as the ones listed here, and they'll gladly accept them. And you can also buy and support from these locations too, to help keep them running. So now for the low source reduction, we'll talk about recycling. So why recycle? Why recycle, excuse me. Uh, recycling is important, right? There's a lot of talk, a lot of articles and op-eds about, oh, recycling this, recycling that, but it works. It wouldn't have existed if it didn't work. Right. These are some real tangible savings when it comes to environmental, uh, you know, whether it be greenhouse gas emissions, whether it be conservation of, of energy, uh, removing cars off the road or generating jobs. Recycling does have a multiplier effect if we participate in it and participate in it correctly. Right. So out of the 37.4 million tons available to be recycled, only uh, about 20 million of it are thrown into the trash due to lack of access and participation to recycling. So if those 20 million tons were recycled, we would, we would get this additional benefit that you see there on the chart. Another, uh, but I think complicated, a, a major issue complicating recycling, as you may have heard about in the news, is the China's recycling ban a few years ago, uh, Operation uh, Green Fence, um, which basically banned uh, recycling coming in to Chinese ports. Uh, and a lot of it is due to, uh, you know, contamination uh, in recycling bins. There's a video here I linked to, it's called Plastic China, which shows kind of our recycling on the other end uh, before this ban. So I, it's really kind of, uh, and really interesting. I highly recommend you check it out if you have time. But it was basically a, a defense mechanism that they put in place to prevent, you know, over contamination and, and just pollution on their shores. So, you know, we've had to react and try to work on addressing this problem here at home because of this, because we really relied on China being a main, uh, a main location to bring our uh, recycling. So the contamination percentage enforced by China is about 0.5%. 
where we're currently at above 25%. So that's a big chasm to try to bridge here. Um, and I'll show you some examples, right? Does, do these uh, bins look familiar? You may have seen these uh, driving down your street to work today. So some examples of contamination include plastic bags, polystyrene or styrofoam, food waste, plastic wrap, also recyclables in plastic bags. So that's also a big no-no. And this is what that looks like at our transfer station. So these are photos I take, I took, right? You even see, you know, certain appliances, you see paint, it looks like a lot of plastic film uh, and you know, items that not should not go into the curbside recycling program. Also, you'll have batteries. We have battery fire. So we encourage people to recycle their batteries uh, at places that sell them, uh, like big box stores, like your, your home, home depots and your Lowe's of the world. Also, battery stores should be taking them back as well. And also, we do have hazardous waste events, though we don't have uh, a waste event scheduled yet here in Orange County. So stay tuned to that. This is what plastic bags look like when they're caught in the materials recovery facilities. Uh, so you can see the picture on the top is kind of what happens after a typical day at the MRF. Um, and you also see tanglers and ropes and wires in there as well. On the bottom is a, a relatively clean version of the same set of rollers. And this is what it takes to get rid of that material, right? You have to stop the whole contraption, you have to stop the facility, stop operations, and have guys go in there to really spend a long time to try to get that, that piece of equipment operational again. So let's go back to the basics. What can we recycle? We can recycle any kind of clean mixed paper, uh, try to avoid uh, any kind of food uh, soiled paper, like pizza boxes, paper plates, napkins, etc. Any clean mixed paper is totally fine and acceptable. Any clean metal that's not um, uh, any kind of clean household metal, like uh, cans, foil, um, is accepted. Of course, please rinse and wipe as much as you can. Um, we don't take any kind of other kind of scrap metal. That should be brought to scrap metal yards, where you can probably get even, uh, you know, uh, paid for some of the scrap metal you bring over there. But as far as kitchen uh, household metal, you can bring it, you know, put it in your recycling bin. Glass, uh, check your local programs. Um, but at Orange County transfer stations, we do accept bottles and jars. I highly recommend though that folks bring bottle deposit bottles and jars to a reverse vending machine at their local supermarket, not only to try to get the refund, but it ensures that a higher quality material will come out of it to be able to turn into recyclable products. Products that have can use recycled material. Uh, so plastic, um, a lot of folks are fixated on looking at the numbers while they are helpful. They only just tell you what type of resin it is. Really what I like to focus on, to help people get more people involved in recycling, make it as easy as possible for folks and kind of eliminate confusion is to focus on the shape. So we really want to focus on bottles and junks, right? And other kinds of rigid plastic containers that of course are clean. You don't want to have food residue or any food left in it. Uh, of course, no flimsy plastic or plastic film, uh, no styrofoam, right? If we stick to that rigid plastic, uh, we're good to go, right? Beverage cartons are actually also accepted. Make sure that they're empty. You can put them in your single stream uh, container, totally fine. Um, some folks have questions about um, their, be their recycling being picked up by one truck. I do want to put out there that there are these types of trucks that are out there uh, by many different haulers, um, private haulers, I should say. Most municipal haulers have uh, a truck for a designated truck for trap trash pickups and then designated trucks for um, solid waste. But a lot of private haulers do have. Well, private haulers do also provide service where they're alternating pickups of solid waste and recycling. A lot of private haulers do have dual bay trucks. So this is me see, checking out one in action, actually picking up from my own uh, driveway uh, where there's basically a one hopper, but it separates it into two bays. Uh, so if you see tra uh, your trash and recycling going into uh, a, a truck like that, 
chances are it could be a dual bay. So this is what the track. Uh, this is what your I'm sorry, your single stream looks like once it goes to the materials recovery facility. This is a photo I took last year at the action uh, materials recovery facility in the Bronx. And this is materials, of course, first gets sorted by hand. A lot of the contaminants, like the Capri Sun pouches, plastic bag, gets sorted out by hand. Um, this is that in action. Also, the materials are optically sorted by optical sorters. This material getting bailed. Ermin, we are running out of time. We're supposed to be at the Q&A now. So if you can get to composting as quick as you can, that would be appreciated. Sure. Thank you. So these are materials getting ready to market. And this is what materials get marketed and turned into. Um, before we jump into composting, I want to talk about Recycle Coach. Um, so I went into that long kind of dissertation on the state of recycling because of this tool, right? This tool will help tremendously. It's called Recycle Coach. It's an app that can be downloaded on your mobile phone or on your, uh, you can go do it uh, via your website, via the county website. Um, municipalities, so if you're a representative of a municipality, you can also on, be onboarded to the Recycle Coach program in the county and have the app uh, be put on your own website. Uh, so here's a from the town of Woodbury where folks can actually go in, type their, you know, where, where they live and find out, ask questions about what's recyclable and also about, you know, getting updates on, you know, curbside collection updates, event updates, et cetera. It's a very handy tool. And also local municipalities can use this tool to send out notifications to residents locally. So it's a very useful tool, not only to kind of upgrade recycling information availability to your residents, and also to brand it with your local municipality to kind of really kind of improve the communication on recycling uh, in your local municipality. So if you're- in, That's mm -hmm. free for the municipalities, right? Free of charge. Right. And it can also be downloaded. So if anybody has a phone right now, definitely uh, download it uh, if you have a chance. Right? But it's we're a asking you as municipal connections to really get your municipality to get it on their website so that they can also promote it. Someone just asked in the Q&A, you know, where's the list? Well, the list nowadays, we used to have it. There's hard copies. I'm sure Ermin has it somewhere. But this is the comprehensive, cutting edge, up to date list. So. Um, this is a really great resource. So if we could, uh, if you need help, Irma will help you. I'll help you. We got to get it on your municipal website. Yeah, it's it's the list 2.0. And we do have the list on our website and I'd be happy to share it with everybody uh, post the chat. Uh, but uh, but yeah, this is really where we need to go. Um, and you get push notifications on your phone when you download it on your phone as well as for you know, recycling pickup dates or quizzes, et cetera. There's a lot of great useful information that can be had. And this takes recycling information, uh, education, and outreach to the next level. Uh, so uh, organics and composting. We, show, we saw that food waste and organics are about a third of our total municipal solid waste. Uh, and composting is a great solution to handling that great big chunk of our solid waste. And what is composting? It's the controlled aerobic biological decomposition of organic materials by microorganisms. And these are some of the the benefits of composting, I'm sure a lot of us are very familiar with it. Uh, you can compost too. Uh, we are working on planning a home composter sale. Uh, this is last year's sale. We're working on another one for late June as well this year, so stay tuned. We'd love to have your help in promoting this and getting the word out about it. Uh, it will. The main pickup location will be at the Cornell Cooperative Extension in Middletown. Um, so stay tuned, we'll send out links 
uh, once the site is up and live. Ehrman, will you mention you've worked with many municipalities each year? He does it once or twice and he works with interested municipalities that, again, can get the word out. So um, I don't know if we have any on the call tonight, but if anyone does want to put in the chat, if they have worked with Ehrman and talk about it, it's um, it's the first thing. You don't want to transport your organic waste. That's polluting more. You want them to keep it on their property and be able to compost right then and there. So that's like the first defense. So com com whatever. composting at home is the best way to handle it. So like you said, you don't have to transport it. If you just spend a little time managing it, it's not really a lot of management uh, that goes into it. Um, but you can really handle, like I said, up to a third of your solid waste um, at, with a cur home curbside, uh, with a home composting bin. For those who can't or are unable to do uh, composting at home, we are working on uh, updating our food scratch drop-off program. Uh, hopefully we can continue the same locations at uh, the locations that you see here uh, into 2024. Uh, maybe even expand. We have some discussions with some local sites. If you have a if you have a farmer's market or another type of location that you think would be a good fit uh, for a food scrap drop off, we can talk about that offline as well. Uh, we'd definitely be interested in ex considering expanding and talk about what uh, goes into having a food scrap drop off program. But this is a little snapshot of what we did last year. Right here's what we can take and what we can't take. Of course, no meat, dairy, or uh, any other kind of trustable items that you know that really could <laughs> foul up any kind of uh, composting program. Um, but of course, any kind of veggie uh, matter, fruit matter, nuts, etc., totally fine and acceptable. Uh, here is our fruit scrap diversion at the farmers market in 2023. Uh, on the left, you see a photo from Warwick. On the right, uh, in Goshen. Uh, those little uh, containers on the left that you see the gentleman holding, dropping his food scraps into, uh, we've provided a limited amount for every farmer's market that did sign on and start this program. Uh, we also have active and educated volunteers helping to educate market goers on how to drop off their food scraps. This lady brought her uh, carrots to have their carrot tops chopped off into the compost bin. So it's a nice little added service that we provide there. Here's some feedback from um, the Grow Local Greenwood Lake group and uh, Donahue Farm. Uh, Donahue Farm it helps run, helps take the materials from the Cornwall food scrap drop off. So these are just some numbers that they provided, you know, on their social media, which are pretty inspiring. And also, um, for those who want to help businesses um, divert food waste. Um, the Center for Eco Technology is offering free services to their Rethink Food Waste New York program. Uh, it's really great. It's free. I know Lisa. She she's very helpful. Lisa Lisa Pellegrino. If you have a business improvement district or downtown with restaurants that have food scraps, naturally she'll help make sure that they get diverted. Um, and also they help with if, if you're a municipality that is interested in even in even uh, establishing your own composting facility. They can help provide any information and resources on that as well. Okay, that's really about it. And thank you for your time. Great. Thank you so much, Ehrman. Um, you know, just because now I rushed him through that and I apologize. The emphasis of this is what um, the county can help with, um, but it's still very volunteer heavy, but it is the way to go. Farmers markets, high visibility. Unfortunately, the town of Montgomery does not have one, a farmer's market, but they have co uh, community gardens, maybe there. Greenwood Lake, that Ehrman just showed us a slide, really was instrumental in starting this whole program. Um, and they have a great one because they take the compost and they bring it right into their garden. So those are your four, and Ehrman, you could tell me if I'm, you need volunteers, one. You need consistency. You have to be at the markets every week. You need a way to transport and you need a place to go. Um, Greenwood Lake is kind of there. They have the volunteers or they have one that leads the whole thing and they're getting more, um, but they have a place to go and their volunteers transport it. They're there every week. It's very successful. Um, Ehrman now is at the Goshen one every week. Um, but you know that that woman, when she saw the carrot tops, 
She knows she purchases it and she comes over. Ermin sits right where they people come and go. They'll say, yes, we don't want these things. It fills our garbage. And that's why composting is so important because it cleans up your garbage. If you do do it at home, and I don't have to tell all of you, you're cleaning your garbage once you take out the organic materials. So I won't um, continue the education, but that if you want to do the program, you need the volunteers. We can get you the signage. We can get you different things depending on writing grants and so forth, but we're here to support you. You just need to have some volunteers and that gets challenging. So I don't want to fool anyone. Does anyone have any questions about that or they want to come off um, mic uh, or come on mic, come off uh, mute and ask about anything in particular? And I'm just going to keep talking until someone puts up their hand or interrupts, though. So let's say you do it at a community garden. Let's say you do it at a firehouse. We talked. You lack what happens if you put out the can. And trust me, I'm still all about this. You put out a can, then you open yourself up to contamination. And that's not what you want after you, everyone separates this and carefully transports it and then brings it. And then some idiot brings and contaminates it. Having said that, I would like to ask Ehrman a few questions. I think that consistency is so important. And I think looking at your slides, the color of recycling containers throughout our country always changes, green, blue, brown. It should be consistent. Um, most recently a city put all the recycling in yellow. Where did you pull yellow out? Usually they say a blue, usually a green. Sometimes you see the brown. It needs consistency with colors and it needs consistency with types of plastic and the things that it accepts. I already know all my answers because I've complained about this a lot, but it is something that needs to change and I'm a big top down. We need regulation. Um, we need, I just want to apprise you all that there's a lot of local laws out there or a local law initiative, skip the straw, skip the utensils. These are great things for your businesses because they're saving money. They don't wanna put in straws, utensils, condiments, napkins. They're saving money by not putting it in local restaurants. And therefore, it's one less thing that someone, person who bought it is putting in the garbage that you're now the taxpayer is paying because it's getting transported and going to the landfill before it stops at um, the town municipal exchange facility. Um, so those are local laws. You could take active roles in doing something like that. Um, I also want to remind, because he, again, I felt like he went over it after I pushed him, and I'm sorry, Ehrman, but how glass, which is much better than plastic in some ways, um, and is the preferred in some ways, but is terrible because of contamination. It will likely break, and all the little pieces will contaminate everything. And it just is wasteful. So it's so important to separate the glass with the plastic, with the metal, it's better than with the paper. So the dual stream is something else that would be um, helpful. These are all opportunities that your municipality can drive forward, um, but there's a lot more opportunities out there. Um, if anyone wants to speak to them or preferences, or again, Ermin, if you wanna say anything about that. Um, just, I just want to reiterate that, um, and I think you mentioned it earlier, it takes all of us to kind of really, you know, join together and, and, and work together on a lot of these projects. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of outreach and education, uh, but it's going to take folks willing to kind of play a role, uh, and, 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 and do something kind of a little bit out of their comfort zone, right? It's not easy to separate food scraps, right, uh, in the beginning, but it can become a habit, right? And if we can get more people doing that, you can really make a dent overall in kind of how much waste is going to the landfill. And maybe even a dent in how much, you know, we're paying, you know, in our waste hauling costs. So uh, there's a lot to be said, and there's a lot to unpack from, from what you mentioned earlier, Kate. But I don't know, I think let's open it up for questions from, from everyone. I think Dory has her hand up. Dory. Great. Dory, hey, please. Urban. Hey, hey Kate, how are you? Uh, th thanks for hosting this. This has been fantastic. I absolutely love the idea of the home compost bins. Um, we've talked before about community composting. And as you've noted, it's very difficult to find steady volunteers to be at the farmer's market um, who not only will donate that time, but will also be able to 
understand what can and cannot be composted. So can you give us more information on how to access these home composting bins? And would you be available to do a presentation at uh, Monroe Town Hall? Uh, so yes, I will be happy to, uh, once we have the link for the next event that will be coming up, and I should have that link maybe within the next few days or a week, uh, I'd be happy to share it with you and everybody. Uh, and basically what it is is an online pre-order. So folks can pick what they want, right? There's a couple options. There's rain barrel. There's also some augers and other kind of composting implements. Uh, they can order it online and then pick it up from Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, on that. Uh, I think it will be in late June. So um, we're going to share that far and wide, and hopefully we can all be partners in spreading the word about it because we want more people composting. And yes, I'd be more than happy to no. come to speak at the Monroe Town Hall. Now, Ehrman, he's done this. He's driving these things around in the past years all over in his truck. Um, and that's another problem, right? How do you get it there? He can't go and do this everywhere. I'm thinking, but again, as someone would say, oh, I don't know if I want to purchase that. I don't want to go to Cornell. Is it an opportunity that Monroe could take one of their dump trucks and go and pick it up at CCE, Cornell Cooperative Extension, and bring them back and to the farmer's market? Something like that. We have to think, we have to make it easy for consumers. We can't make it harder. But yet, Ehrman's a one-man show. He can't, you know, he's already tried this. So maybe we start looking and ask the municipality if they could pick it up on a weekday, and then they have it. It's all paid for. They have to pay for them ahead of time. Um, it's on the responsibility of the municipality then that they're driving all these things and they have to get there or the volunteers again. And Monroe, where Dory's from, has at least um, a conservation advisory council. It's really important to merge these groups into a climate smart community so that you have more people. Um, it's important. Well, Dory also sits on the town council, right, Dory? Yes. So how do we get those members? How do we get volunteers to step up and want to sit at that market to do that training, to say, this goes in, this doesn't go in? Well, I think it could potentially start with those home composting bins. It, if we were able, the request would go through Orange County Planning or the request would go through Monroe's website. To, to purchase the composters, it'll be through the Orange County com, uh, website. So what you would do is, uh, you know, residents would purchase and they would get dropped off on the drop off date there. Uh, and if we want, we can pre plan ahead. If we notice, like I, I can get the lists regularly and we can look mm -hmm. at how many are from the town of Monroe or, uh, or the village of Monroe, or whatever. And if you want a pre range coming up and you know, putting it in a box truck and bringing it over and then have a separate day where we can distribute it there. That's up to you. It might be a little bit of extra uh, kind of like double handling, but we can work on ways to make it easier and bring it hyper local. On the education side of things, I'd be happy to come down like you at the town hall and just show people do a basic presentation on the composting. That's not a problem. Okay, that sounds like a great idea. We'll talk more about that offline. Okay. Can I just interject really quick? So I know um, Woodbury, we were one of uh, pickup sites a while ago for the, the compost bins. Um, so if Dory can't pull that together, I know we can easily do it. Uh, you know, our mayor works very well with giving us, we don't have our farmer's market yet. We're still working on that, but, <laughs> but very interested if you needed a location for, uh, for dropping off, you know, for the pickups for, additional rain barrels. Also, the first year I was part of our Climate Smart, our committee created a slide, um, a Zoom meeting of composting. We did vermiculture, we did uh, videos. So we do have a couple of links for video uh, home composting. Aren't you working with your library too? Weren't they supporting you and doing things at the library? That's where we actually had our pickup for. So we did bare root giveaways and we had the compost bins and the rain barrels. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. And if others want to get involved with their library, but they don't know how, um, we have Joanna Goldfarb here from the Catskill Ramapo Library System. 
Um, if you put your name in the chat and you want to put your email to collaborate for future, that would be wise. I'm going to say Lisa's in the town of Woodbury, and I'm going to say that Dennis Fordham um, said, hey, maybe we would be interested in doing a repair cafe. So maybe you want to work together um, closer. I know is Olga still here? We talked about Highlands, Woodbury, Cornwall. Um, but Dennis, certainly you could join our group where we try and get things happening together um, for different things. We should actually, I'm going to reach out to you for the community campaign as well, um, if you're interested. And so if that's a good segue, if we're done with composting, or if no one has any more exact questions, I would like the CACs or the Climate Smart Communities on the call to just do a little updating. I could start with Orange County. What I just alluded to is the towns of Highlands, Highlands, Woodbury, and Tuxedo are working together for their New York State Clean Energy Commission community campaign points. Susie referenced it before, Climate Smart Community Points, Clean Energy Community Points. New York State wants you, wants municipalities to do good things. How do you get them to do it? You motivate them with points. Those points add up and they get a designation. They may even get access to grants and monies at this point. But really what it does is it puts, you check a box the next time you apply for any grant. It could be blacktop, it could be sewer pipes. Any grant, you say, yep, I'm a climate smart community. I'm a clean energy community. Your grant goes to the top of the pile. So that's what puts community elected officials and say, oh, maybe selling home composters wouldn't be such a bad thing. Again, you need the volunteers. And that's where the CAC, the Conservation Advisory Councils, or Climate Smart Committee, or you can merge them, or you can have both. If you have enough volunteers, come in because they could do this work. They could sit at the Monroe Market and say, oh, don't put that bit in. Yes, but yes, we'll take the tea bag. The string's okay. These are the things they can do. Um, so we are now doing an electric vehicle campaign with Highlands and, excuse me, with Woodbury and Tuxedo. We are doing a clean heating and cooling campaign with Highlands, Tuxedo, and Woodbury. And we're doing a community solar campaign with probably just two or three of them. Um, so the town of Monroe is welcome. Anyone is welcome to join. It doesn't have to be adjacent. Adjacent makes sense for the Repair Cafe because you know, again, consistency, consistency, the third Thursday, the third Saturday, those are things that get into people's head every other month. Cornwall has it one month, then the next month is Highlands, then the next month is Cornwall, things like that. Um, so we're doing this, we're kicking it off soon. If you want to join, you get access to monies and points and it's a great thing. If you wanna know more, I'll stop talking. We can tell you afterwards if you wanna hang on, um, and if not, you can reach out to me individually. And if anyone else wants to put their information in the chat, that's always good. Dennis, look, because Woodbury's person is in the chat, get her email and reach out to her now if you're interested in the Repair Cafe collaboration. So does anyone want to say anything or am I just going to go and pick on Lisa, since she just started, wants to give us an update from the town of Woodbury. And Dennis from Monroe, you'll be next, okay? Please go ahead. Thanks, Kate. Um, so yes, like you mentioned, uh, we are doing, a, we have our solar campaign, our cool heating, our heating and cooling campaign and our EV campaign all happening on the same day, our kickoff for it. Uh, we are doing it on April 6th, Saturday, April 6th with our senior center and library here in Woodbury. Uh, we are following that up with our repair cafe it will be on April 13th. April 13th, I want to make sure I get my dates right. And then we are also doing a, we're collaborating with our local library to do a week long uh, Earth Day celebration, mostly kids to go kits of different things. Last year we did compost in a bottle, um, a planting. The kids got to make a little planter, walk away with a planting item. We try and do um, sustainability. This year we're going to recommend maybe like a, a solar portable solar heater cooker that the kids could learn more. You know, you teach them one little thing and they move on from there with what they do. And then, the, so we're going to end our Earth Week with Arbor Day celebration on the 27th. We're planting a tree and we're giving away New York State DEC bare roots at the same time. 
And then we are going into May, May 19th. We're doing a Bees and Blooms educational session at the Senior Center. And that's in with collaboration with one of our local beekeepers who works out at the Orange County Arboretum. And we are working with the Hudson Valley Pollinators Organization for the other speaker of the butterfly part. And then we are going into June 1st, where we are going to celebrate Environmental Day versus Earth Day, since a lot of the vendors that you would want to table for you are all busy during Earth Day. So there is an Environmental Day that we are going to take a opportunity of. So um, that's that's a little bit of what we're doing. So thanks, Kate. That's great. And what is that date? May 13th is what the bees and... May 19th. May 19th. May 19th. It's a Sunday. Great. Yes. Okay. And again, that will be an opportunity for what we're doing for the clean energy campaign. I'm assuming, Lisa, we'll what we're doing is we're working it. with vendors that have electric, that sell electric vehicles, probably right now, Healy cars. We're working with vendors that install heat, clean heat and cooling, geothermal. Um, and the last one is community solar. And all three of them may come to all of her events and try and educate the consumer about it. And then if they sign up, Lisa's, Lisa's municipality, Woodbury and Orange County, get points that lead to uh, points and grants and all those things I said. Right. So and thank people don't you. even need to sign up at the events. They just need to sign yeah. up from the period of time that we are elected as a uh, campaign organization. From there. And you only get points if they install it. But we find out by working with the vendors and so forth. Correct. Or our building inspector. Right. That was what right. we said. Yes. Right. So, all right. So Dennis is going to go and then Gene from Blooming Grove, please. Hello, Dennis Fordham, Bunro Conservation Commission Chairman. Uh, just quickly on the uh, Climate Smart Communities, uh, we have been registered for some time, but we're only fairly recently starting to get, trying to get active. Uh, Dory is a coordinator. Uh, currently, a task force is the Conservation Commission, so we're combined on that. Um, we we have no uh, identified activities as yet. We're still looking into different things. We certainly would be interested to join a regional climate campaign or program. I'd be interested to get more information on what those opportunities are. Uh, and then also to co uh, to cooperate with uh, neighboring communities uh, to, to try and get some uh, ideas and maybe even share some activities. Um, so there, there, there are things looking to the future, and certainly I would like to get feedback and information on those opportunities. Um, we are, uh, one thing we're trying to look at, and Dory is well aware of this, uh, to get a vehicle fleet inventory uh to to see where what vehicles we have and how that how how that can be uh pursued in the future um and i know another thing that maybe we could do is a uh, is a um, greenhouse gas e emissions uh inventory there again we haven't done that not quite sure how we would get that off the ground but that would be an interesting thing to do uh one thing that dory uh informed us of recently was to apply for a grant for the planning capital projects that address climate change. This would be from New York State Grant Program for Municipal Infrastructure Projects. Kate, I'm sure you're familiar with those. Um, so that's one thing we would like to do. So that's Climate Smart Communities, a lot to do in the future. I would really, if they really, if this does get going, to have a separate task force for Climate Smart Communities. I think that's would be the a good way of really getting this going. Because um, it's always difficult to get volunteers. Whilst we have seven seven members, including myself, uh, now everybody's busy. Um, it's tough to get people to do things. Uh, I have more time than most. I'm retired, uh, but I can only do so much on my own. Uh, other things we're doing in the town, uh, the town has been looking into revising a tree preservation law for the last year or so. I personally and the Conservation Commission have made a number of uh, su suggestions and comments uh, to revise and improve the, the draft law. I think we're very close now to, to a, a final uh, tree law. Um, uh, that's, 
it would be interesting, not now because it's too involved, but there's a lot of things that we're doing and proposing to do with their tree law. I would love to know what other towns are are, are doing with with their tree law or tree preservation uh, activities. Um, I don't want to think that we're going out on a limb with something totally different to anywhere else. Uh, we want to preserve every tree in our town. Obviously, that's not practical. Uh, local residents and and, uh, and um, uh, property owners ha have a right and should be allowed to take down certain trees for certain reasons. Um, so there's a need for tree, uh, tree removal permits under certain conditions, uh, uh, replanting trees to replace trees taken down, penalty costs if, 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 they, if they're not uh, replaced in any way. Um, they're all the things that we're looking into, and uh, um, with the new law, that they're, they're they're pretty strict, and and uh, uh, some would consider onerous. But we're still moving ahead, and Dory is well aware of that. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's it. very quickly. Other activities we we do obviously we do occasional sighting inspections for the building inspector, mainly focusing on on the tree plan and impacts on the trees and so on. We're looking to do a tree inventory. Uh, uh, this would be looking primarily at uh, uh, specimen trees, significant trees, and the larger trees. Uh, that's something we hope to to get more done this year. Um, some years ago, the town did a lot of stream walks where reports were done on on the condition uh, uh, of, of various streams and small rivers in the town. We're starting to look at those old reports now, which some of them go back about ten years, and to see whether we can pick on some of them to redo or start to do some some stream walks to see what the issues are. A lot of them I know would be contamination, uh, garbage and so on. Uh, so that's one thing that I'd like to get going. Um, Arbor Day with 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 the town, we're looking to to try and uh, do an Arbor Day uh, group activity, certainly to have uh, trees, uh, saplings and, and plantings available. So, yeah. Always interested to, to know what's happening in other towns as well. Dennis, that was great. And um, I like the way you said, hey, we're combined. And then you went and said, which is great. And then you went and said, I really like it separate. And it would be because if everyone knows, understands, the Conservation Advisory Councils were the first one around. Your primary role for a Conservation Advisory Council is to look at all proposed development for any environmental ramifications. That's what they need to do. So that's what you're doing. And then secondary is you get to do all these other fun things. Um, the tree, excuse me, the stream walks uh, is what he's referencing is the monitoring of streams that Monroe started decades ago. And that's really great because you keep that data. And now if you go back and you look at that data and you compare it to now, um, you could see what is the health of your stream? What's the status? How has it changed? Is it impaired? Um, these are things that really the state could be doing, depending on the water, of course, but that state's overwhelmed, we know, and doesn't get to even half the wetlands aren't mapped. Um, that's changing, by the way. Please see, look up that. When you're on the sustainability page of the county, we talked about that at one of the last sessions. Um, but Monroe has a lot of development, and you're going to see that in these streams. So these are really great activities for you to be doing. The tree preservation law, I cannot say everyone needs. Um, I will also say the tree inventory. I have tried for a long time. I've been here a while, so I say that a lot and apologize. But I've tried for the county to work with the municipalities to do it on county and town village roads. Um, there's some things I've been told liability. That's why most people will refuse to do it. But I will tell you there's monies out there for a tree inventory. Uh, grants, so as well as tree management plans, there are monies there. And lastly, I beg you to come up with a tree replacement formula. I think that's so important. And Monroe has done something with their second iteration of this law now. And lo and behold, maybe Jean will bring it up from Blooming Grove, but Blooming Grove has a solar project and it is right next to Monroe. And they're removing tree and the parcel I think goes into both communities, but they're only removing the trees in Monroe. And I think they're getting a wake up call of, oh, there's this new law and it's a big deal. So you will protect your development by getting your house in order now. 
get a tree management plan at minimum, get a tree replacement formula, something like 50% of trees can be removed. Um, no tree over 12, probably 18 dbh which is diameter breast height can be removed that's going to dictate where the developer can really put things on the site and how much they can maximize the site yes you certain developers may say this is worth it and go somewhere else that may be a good thing in some cases um so if you want more information about that i'm here to help you with that but this is so important to emphasize the trees so important um, and I bet you Dennis is a pro now. Uh, we did lose <laughs> Olga. I'll give her report later from what I can remember. Why don't we go to Jean from Blooming Grove? And then Tracy, you're going to give a report from Chester, I hope. Okay, hopefully she does. And then Patricia from Montgomery. Go ahead, Jean. So, um, yes, I will not address the tree preservation piece of it. Um, we do have some legislation that is with our uh, planner, and hopefully it'll get to the board sooner than later. Um, two things I do want to focus on is that uh, yesterday we were at the town board uh, uh, work session, and a few months back we had asked that instead of being an advisory commission that we become a board. And I know in the county there's only one other, and that's in Warwick. But so, you can uh, because you've done it. You've done your natural resource inventory, so you can. Yeah. Well, if they support you. That's the thing. So um, when we asked a few months ago, we basically were told to wait because there was an election coming up and there were new people coming on the board. So yesterday, um, Ron Kidstrow, who is our, our chair, uh, he did a presentation to the board explaining the benefits of, of us now becoming a board as well. So um, we'll see what they decide. Um, it would be it would be huge if that if that occurred. Um, so we'll see. So the other thing I'd like to share with you all is that um, we have taken on a project down in the village of Washingtonville. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Naomi Sewell Richardson Park that's right there on West Main Street on the Moodna. There had been previously three homes there that were lost in um, Superstorm Sandy um, and one of the other big hurricanes uh, because it's right in the floodplain. And back in 2017, the land had been dedicated to Naomi Sewell Richardson, who was a resident in one of the homes uh, died at like age 100 uh, a number of years ago, but was relevant. Uh, she started a, the uh, second uh, African-American sorority at Howard University, and it's now, uh, she was one of the founders. It's now the largest uh, sorority in the world, African-American sorority in the world. So that's the reason why the par park was named after, because she's very relevant to the community that way. Um, but, and it was de dedicated back in uh, 2017 and nothing has happened. So we've taken it on. And with that, we've used it as a way to also engage high school students and get young people to come to our meetings and also to get involved in, in, in moving forward with developing the park. So that's where we are. We, this, this was an idea that started a year ago. We're working with the mayor in, in uh, Washingtonville and moving forward. We had trees for trips there just the other day. They're gonna come back in October and with plantings. Um, we have interest in terms of funding it. Uh, we started our own separate foundation, uh, not for profit, so we can do fundraising easily. And uh, we're, we're just getting it out there to the community. We met with the Kiwanis Club. People are excited. We need something beautiful. We need something people can all wrap themselves around. So we're going to be at the first event is March 23rd, Bagpipes and Bonnets. It's a Washingtonville event there in Vernon Allen Park. And we're also going to share with people while we're there not just getting them informed and having them buy uh, seeds. Oh, by the way, this is going to be a pollinator pathway. We're doing up pollinating plants. Um, and there'll be a bandstand there as well. Things that, though, that will be totally sustainable because, again, it isn't a floodplain. Um, but just to also inform people about the CAC and what the CAC does, because most people, they have no idea what we're all about. So we're taking this opportunity with the park to help bring greater awareness to the fact that there even is such an organization within the local government. And hopefully you can get more volunteers through your efforts. Absolutely. You know, first you've done a lot, but there's a lot of other things I'll talk about that you could be doing. So I don't know if the park, um, having sat on my parks and rec board for the last 20 something years, the park should be doing the maintenance of this park but a lot of times they don't as right. i know 
So either you're going to go and say and demand it and ask and ask, and they just don't do it. You got to step up or shut up. So thank you for doing it. I'm just hoping you can get some volunteers that come out then that get interested. And like Dennis said, you can grow and then you could have a committee that wants to do LED lighting and someone else that wants to do community choice and someone else wants to compost. You know, it's great. You're doing pollinators. That's something else that no one has reported. Uh, Warwick's very big at that. Um, I think Montgomery, but thank you for doing that. So um, well, we, we're, wonderful. we're getting volunteer. We are getting people to step up. We've got Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. I mean, good people are they are excited. They they've good. looked at this bear site for too long. So um, right to your point, I, yeah. I I think I think we're off on the right foot. Great. All right. So Patricia Hennigan from the town of Montgomery has been doing this for quite a few decades herself. Uh, they've saved a farm. They've done it all. Patricia, do you want to give us an update on what you've done recently? Are you there? Well, you're fine. There she is. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Um, okay. So one very exciting thing that just happened uh, recently is we've tr been trying for over um, a year to get a, a water source protection program for the town. And um, we looked into CEAs um, that wasn't accepted. But um, this latest one that we presented to them through a uh, run through DEC and the Department of Health, the Drinking Water Source Protection Program, was approved this past week. So um, they did agree to participate in that, which involves, it's about an 18-month program, um, and basically it involves um, putting together a plan for um, drinking water protection. So, um, you know, we're happy about that. Um, we've also been doing Repair Cafe for a few. Uh, we had our third one not too long ago. We're planning another one maybe for May or June. <clears throat> um, we have, um, we're actually looking for more fixers right now. Um, people mentioned uh, they'd like to have shoes and also knife sharpening. Um, we uh, are doing um, what we do every spring usually is um, we have a special maintenance for the trees for trips that we planted <clears throat> at Benedict Farm Park. And we also do a clearing of the bluebird houses, which um, uh, we have quite a few in the park. Um, oh, and, um, there was a, a, a very good workshop on battery storage um, recently, which um, interested me because the town did just um, have a, um, just instituted a, about three or four months ago, a um, one year moratorium on batteries. So there was a lot of opposition to having them around. And I think um, the inf some of the information from this workshop um could be used for um you know maybe to change people's minds a little bit about them um okay. we do uh, we do work the library um we have they've uh, participated with our repair cafe we also started a seed library there last year so um, we do plant exchanges and we bring in programs. Um, we have master gardeners uh, present some programs for the library. And we were very happy because we got two new um, members for our uh, council. So um, we're hoping to be able to cover more things. <laughs> yeah. All right. Excellent. Um, so for those of you who don't know, CEA she started with is a critical environmental area, and they spent over a year uh, working on this, and then it wasn't accepted um, for different reasons that I guess we don't have time now. But if you want to know, reach out to my, um, Patricia, maybe put your email in the chat. Uh, so then they went for the small, excuse me, the drinking water source protection program. Both of these, many of these programs are all through New York State Department of Environmental Protection. So there are people and sources out there to help you get these things done. Ask me, I can connect you with them if you need. 
Um, I'm going to go throw back to Susie. Susie, are you still making dinner? Are you still there? This is something that bothers me. And I was going to bring it up before and I've brought it up before. At these repair cafes, they are offering knife sharpening, which you some, can yeah. get in some places. They're yeah. not doing shoes, to my knowledge. Bikes, okay. computers. Okay. Now, the bikes and the computers, you can go to stores and get that. So there's this fine line when you say shoes, but in Orange County, we don't have the knife sharpener truck that goes up and down. And trust me, I looked <laughs> into it. Um, you know, we don't have the shoe people. I, I went to the one in Monroe many years ago and there was a sign, went to a meeting, be back in an hour. You know, you can't, you got it. This is how you do business. So um, how do you find that that line? The bike people would tell me, no, we come, we do minor. And then when they have big ones, they know where to get us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do you think, Susie, about that? Where is well, that? I think what we've had is such growth that people are starting to misunderstand. We are not a service and we are not a government service. And so this is a totally volunteer run organization. And so you get what you get, you know, I mean, everyone is there out of the goodwill of their own heart. And so, you know, we are working very hard. I am working very hard to put on a fixer training Zoom series behind the scenes and knife sharpening is on our agenda. Uh, you know, I'm trying very hard to increase the skills of the people who are willing to come and do these cafes. But again, just like um, whoever was talking about, you know, how do you get people to sit at the farmer's market and tell you what, you know, to put in what bin? It's all volunteers. And so, you know, we do the best we can. And we're always happy when a bike shop comes and, and does some free work. But of course, they're a business and they need to feed their their families. Right. too. So we, it's That's a right. delicate balance. Right. All right, so I'm just going to report to tell you that Olga from Highlands had to leave, but they were very they were the first count, uh, municipality in the town, excuse me, the first town in the county to pass community choice aggregation, which is uh does anyone want to know what it is cuz that's on our website too and I don't want to bore you it's the end we've gone over. Call me if you need to know. It's basically instead of those people calling you, remember years ago they would call you and try and sell you solar energy and it's going to be cheaper. And instead of them calling each home for you to opt in, the municipality decides, I'm just going to do this for all our residents. And therefore, if you don't want the green energy or the lower priced brown energy, which is not green energy, um, you have to opt out. So it's a it's a good thing because it's a co-op, economies of scale, purchasing. Um, so you're getting a better rate. However, it is still market driven. And unfortunately, it was not a good time when Highlands got in. But they're, they're going and the town of Tuxedo is following them. They've also worked with Ermin doing the compost um, bins. Um, they're doing the repair cafe. They're trying to save buildings there, um, green building. They have a lot going on. Um, and most recently, they're working since that area was so impacted with floods last year. They're working now with the clean heating and cooling renovations. So that's Olga. Anyone who didn't get to speak, Dennis McConnell, um, Dory, do you want to say anything else? Does anyone want to say anything else? They think you all know where you could find me. And I know others have shared their information and I can connect you if you'd like. Otherwise, I could let you all go home. Dennis is with the Town of Warwick Planning Board. And um, I'm not sure if he wants to say anything. Uh, individually, but the planning board doesn't do too much of this. They could really buy into the tree thing and support it. Um, but they also have a conservation advisory council in the town of Warwick. And I think they may be starting a climate smart committee as well. Um, if no one else has to say anything, wants to say anything, I want to let you all go. This information will be available. I will connect Dennis with Lisa to talk about that repair cafe. I have down that to do. Anyone want to give me any other homework? Does anyone want to talk to anyone about anything? I think, I think you're doing a great job, Kate. Thanks for keeping up the good work. Thank you, Dory. I'm right back at you. And I think you're going to talk to Ermin about um, having that presentation. And yep. um, we'd love to be back at your farmer's market. So that would be good, too. And uh, I'll probably be calling you about something someday soon. Yeah. Good. This, this Thanks, been, Kate. This, thank you so much. It's been very interesting. A lot to absorb. Um, there's a lot more we should be doing. Just need yeah. the uh, uh, the uh, the hands and feet to do it. <laughs> That's right. We need okay, the thank you. Okay. Great. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. I'll have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night.
Take care. Thanks, Jean, for replacing Ryan. We appreciate that. If you're still there and Ermin, we're hanging up now. You're good. Okay. Night, night all.